Jerry Bossler once said that Jean-Paul Guerlain was an old lion. And he said that quote when he was interviewed after he officially became in-house perfumer when Jean-Paul Guerlain was, um, was unadmirably dismissed from service for saying some racially, um, you know, some, some racially motivated things on television. So this is going to be a perfumer's portfolio on Jean-Paul Guerlain, the man, his perfumes that are in my collection. But it's also going to talk about the aura around the house of Guerlain that I think about. So to me, Guerlain represents old world perfume. They represent all of the greatness from the past. I remember Jean-Paul Guerlain doing an interview and scoffing at the fact that they would do market research. Guerlain doesn't do market research, he said. Not in the sense of testing and, you know, stuff like that. Uh, he would make a fragrance that he wanted to make based on the way he thought that a Guerlain fragrance should be. And he would put it out. Uh, and that was pretty much the extent of the market testing. They didn't get, they didn't work with the marketing team back then in, in Jean-Paul Guerlain's days. And so he has created, you'll notice from my collection, he has created some of the most beautiful perfumes that I've ever had a chance to smell. His house, the people who have come before him, have created some of the most beautiful creations uh, that the fragrance world has ever seen. I would say some of the most prestigious, classic, you know, just uh, reference fragrances of their genres. Some of them even created new genres, as we'll talk about here in this video. So this is a perfumer's portfolio on Jean-Paul Guerlain, but it's also going to be about the brand a bit as a whole. You can't talk about Ger Jean-Paul Guerlain without talking about Guerlain. So um, we're going we're gonna to try to get through this. Uh, there's a lot of perfumes to talk about. There's a lot of topics that I want to talk about. I'm sure some of this I will end up forgetting. Um, some of the things I want to say I'll probably end up forgetting because there's so much information here. There's so much emotion tied to Jean-Paul Guerlain, um, for me anyways. Uh, and then you take into account the fact that if you look up Jean-Paul Guerlain now, all you'll read about is his abuse scandal. He's you know, in his 80s, uh, and he has dementia, basically. He has Alzheimer's, and uh, he there was an abuse scandal going on, um, you know, with the woman he wanted to marry. They wouldn't allow him to uh, marry the woman that he wanted to marry. They wouldn't give him enough funds to keep his estate up and running, didn't have enough food for the horses, didn't have enough water to water the plant, that kind of thing. Very sad scenario at the Guerlain estate at the moment. So it, this, this video is going to incorporate the ups of his career, of which there were many. He had many mountaintop experiences, but he also, like I started in the beginning, um, with the uh, racially uh, skewed comments he also has had his, his dives, the ups and the downs. But this is not um, a judgment on him. This is talking about the man, the nose, if you will, because that's what he was. He was the nose of the Guerlain house for many years, for decades. And a lot of these creations came about because of his nose and because of the a heritage that Guerlain created, passing down from one perfumer to the next. You know, Creed had a slogan for a while there. I don't know if they still do. It said, from father to son f since 1776 or something. And that turned out to be a lie. Um, the, if you've read Gabe Oppenheimer's book, The Ghost Perfumer, you know that that's a lie, uh, according to the book. But the Guerlain heritage from father to son since... 1830 or whenever the Guerlain house was founded. That is true. There is truth to that. It was a family business for the longest time. And in fact, now Thierry Vasser, the in-house perfumer, is the first non-Guerlain to hold that position. So let's talk about some of the perfumes, which is why you're all here. But before we do that, I am going to do scent of the day. Even though it's taking us a little bit off course and there's a lot of fragrances to discuss, there's a lot of content, 
I want to talk about this perfume because, you know, I have thick skin in the in in the fragrance world. People say things about me, and I I let it just roll off my back. You know, um, I I just let the water roll off my back. I don't let it get to me. Whatever. I just continue to go. Put my head forward. This is a perfume that's my scent of the day. It's called Encre Noir. And the reason I bring up having thick skin is because I've been called a lot of things lately. Um, one of which is gatekeeper. A gatekeeper is someone that puts up barriers and keeps people out. You know, they don't want people to know the knowledge that you know. They don't want they don't want the group to grow, right? They want to be the ones in charge. They want to be the ones with the knowledge, and they don't want you to know about certain things because they want to keep that knowledge to themselves, which gives them power. On the other hand, my whole purpose of doing this channel is to share that knowledge with you guys. And so one of the things I want to share is one of my favorite vetiver perfumes ever. In fact, the reason I mentioned this gatekeeper thing is if I was a gatekeeper, I would say Roja's vetiver at $500 for 50 ml is the best vetiver fragrance. It's not. In fact, this bottle of Ancre Noir I got from, I want to say fragrancebuy.ca, maybe one of the other ones, maybe Fragrance X, I can't exactly remember, but one of the discounters, and I paid around $24 for this bottle. And this perfume, Ancre Noir, the original, I also have the Alextreme, I also have the Sport, I love them all. They're all Nathalie Lorson creations. I think this is a better vetiver fragrance than Roja's Vetiver, which again is a $500 vetiver fragrance for the Parfum version. Okay, you can get the Parfum Cologne, which I think is pants, for half of that price and you get 100 ml instead of 50. But, um, you know, the gatekeepers will say, oh, but you're not smelling the real Parfum version. No. For me, it's a thumbs down. Ancre Noir wipes the floor with Roja's Vetiver. Which, speaking of Guerlain and speaking of Roja, Roja is almost birthed from the Guerlain family in a way because he worked for Guerlain for 35 years uh, or whatever it was, however long it was, 30 years. I don't know exactly how long. But a lot of his perfumes have some connection to Guerlain's of the past or famous fragrances from the past but heavily skewed, skewed towards the Guerlain side of things. Um, but I just wanted to mention that because if you're somebody who is on a budget and you, you want a good vetiver perfume and you're a vetiver lover, don't think this is bad because this is cheap. Don't make the mistake that I made early in my, earlier in my perfume journey and associate high cost with high quality. High cost doesn't always equal high quality. It doesn't equal good blending. It might equal good ingredients. But if you don't know what to do with the ingredients, sometimes it doesn't equal good ingredients. Sometimes you're just paying the high cost for the fact that you're paying the high cost and they, and they want you to think it's a Veblen good, that kind of thing. So this is a perfume, Ancre Noir, that it's absolutely stunning. If you like dark, broody, smoky vetivers, it basically um, translates to dark ink. And that's why it looks like it's in an old ink bottle. You know, in the old days when you would see the, you know, um, you would see someone like Beethoven writing with a quill, you know, in a movie, of course, but they would recreate Beethoven sitting by candlelight, writing with a quill, writing his music, and he would dip that pen into the ink and then write, that's what the ink bottles look like. This is what this is supposed to represent. And it's a perfect name, Encre Noir, because what Nathalie Lawson did is she used uh, vetiviral acetate, which is basically the most important perfumer uh, ingredient to a perfumer. Your Rose sent me a breakdown once and vetiviral acetate was the number one used, the most important ingredient. Uh, and she mixed it with a couple different types of vetiver, bourbon vetiver and Haitian vetiver. And then she did her, her usual trick, which she does so well, of using this peppery musk with this, cash, with this cashmere wood, which is, which is a synthetic material. Um, I think there's probably a lot of synthetic material in here to some extent. 
but some of my favorite vetivers have that synthetic feel to it. Nishane's Sultan Vetiver has a lot of that synthetic mixture, but I love that fragrance, and I love Ancre Noir. And then she blended it with Cypress, which is such an underused note in perfumery. I absolutely love Cypress, and I wish they used it more in masculine perfumery. And it's just a stunning vetiver. And, you know, vetiver is one of those scents that cannot be recreated in a lab. If you're smelling vetiver, you're smelling the actual vetiver oil itself. Um, they, don't, they don't synthesize vetiver. Uh, and so, depending on where you get it, you might get different facets. Bourbon vetiver might smell different from Haitian vetiver, might smell different from Javanese vetiver, or whatever it is. But... Um, this is a very high quality fragrance and I think MSRP on this is over a hundred dollars. So when you see these at discounters and you see it at 24 bucks, like I got my hundred ML bottle, brand new sealed, right? That is a steal. You know, that is, uh, that's high value for money. So I wanted to mention that, uh, because that, that type of behavior is not something that gatekeepers do. I'm not trying to keep people out by saying, if you don't have Roja's vetiver, you don't know real vetiver. That's a lie. This is one of his worst perfumes, in my opinion. And this is a better fragrance than, than Roja's vetiver, Ancre Noir. So, don't equate low cost or good, or, you know, finding something at a, at a discounted rate like this with low value. This is a very high value for money fragrance for me. And if you're a vetiver lover, you have to check out Ancre Noir. That's my scent of the day. I'm absolutely loving it. It's going to rain here in Texas today later, so I decided it's perfect for the rain, by the way. Uh, it's also a very um, professional scent. You know, if you want to put yourself forward as like a very serious person, Vetiver is beautiful. Okay, let's get into Guerlain, and let's talk a little bit about the history. So, uh, Pierre-Francois Guerlain died in 1864. And at that point, his son, Amy Guerlain, took over his place at the perfumer's organ. And there were a lot of different new things that were happening during Amy's reign. New synthetic ingredients, new, you know, new, new um, molecules it, it understood, discovered, stuff like that. And basically, Amy Guerlain is known for creating one major fragrance, one major perfume. And that perfume is called Jiki. Now, Jiki came out in 1889, I believe, and it's the first perfume that supposedly used modern synthetics to create a, a fragrance. Uh, if you know Jiki, it does have a little bit of that. I, I used to describe it as halitosis accord, um, as that, you know, as that warm breath type feel that you would get. And I think it's because there were two animalic notes that used to be used in Jiki. One is ambergris. And of course, back in the late 1800s or when this was created in the early, you know, a turn of the century even. And who knows how long Guerlain used real ambergris in this. But ambergris can give that ozonic, um, almost like oceanic, um, sparkly, atmospheric vibe to a perfume, but real ambergris can be animalic. It comes from the inside of a sperm whale, and depending on how long it floated in the sea, depending on how long it sat on the beach until someone found it, depending on how much salt it took in, depending on the whale's diet, depending on, you know, what part of this world's ocean it floated in, all that can affect the change. Ambergris can, is not a material that you can just nail down and say, I'm going to put ambergris in here and it's going to smell the same here and the same there. No. Um, so I used to describe it as this halitosis-like feel, but maybe that's not being fair to the perfumer. I've been trying to think of a different way to describe ambergris um, in Jiki, because Jiki has this very... Um, it, it, it's definitely a fougere fragrance, if you will, um, but it has this ambergris civet mixture which gives this old school animalic vibe uh and this spicy animalic is what you get but it's mixed with beautiful ingredients like lavender like rose 
like vetiver. I mentioned vetiver early, earlier. Rosewood, sandalwood, there's even some of that Guerlainade vanilla in the base of Jiki. Now, this is the Eau de Parfum. I got this tester bottle for a song, so I, I couldn't say no, even though it is without a cap. Sometimes that's the price of accumulating fragrances you want at a decent price. Don't just go pay full retail for things. You know, try to try to get yourself a deal when you can. As long as you know you're you're not getting a deal because it's fake or something crazy like that, or if you trust the person you buy from, that kind of thing. Um, and there's citruses in the opening, so you get that citruses with some rosemary, some patchouli, some orris root, jasmine, uh, even a bit of tonka and frankincense in the base. There's a lot going on in the eau de parfum. I don't know exactly when they released the eau de parfum. The eau de toilette came out, like I said, in 1889, I believe it was. Um, <clears throat> And this kind of took its place in perfume history as the first perfume that uh, used modern synthetics. And then Jacques Guerlain took over from his uncle, Amy Guerlain. And Jacques Guerlain is one of the greatest perfumers of all time, in my opinion, along with Jean-Paul Guerlain. But to get to Jean-Paul Guerlain, we have to go through Jacques Guerlain. Uh, and I will do an entire perfumer's portfolio video on Jacques Guerlain uh, as well, himself. But basically, with Jacques Guerlain, he started out with this. And this is Mouchoir de Monsieur. I absolutely love this fragrance. I love it even more than Jiki. I don't know exactly why either. Uh, there's just something about it that when I wear Mouchoir de Monsieur, uh, I just instantly clicked with it. Jiki, I kind of went... Mm, it's a little, it's, it's a little much for me. Um, I think with Mouchoir de Monsieur, they amped up the lavender bits even more. And it is a little bit powdery. I think there is a iris note in um, Mouchoir de Monsieur that you don't get in Jiki. I believe there's an iris note. And maybe that iris, that powderiness from the iris... It's a very similar fragrance to Jiki. Some people say you don't need both. If you let me keep only one, I would keep Mouchoir de Monsieur. But the, the idea with this is it still has the ambergris. It still has a little bit of that civet. Even though there's none listed in Parfumo, you get a bit of that same... If you guys can think of a better term than halitosis, let me know. But you get a little bit of that funk, that animalic funk, if you will. It's not like modern animalic funks either. This is completely different. This is a different type of animalic funk than modern animalics that you're probably thinking of. Um, and it keeps the rose, it keeps the patchouli, it adds lemon verbena at the top, which adds this like grassy, this green grassiness, if you will. Uh, and then cinnamon. And the cinnamon, the oak moss, the iris, the vanilla, and of course the lavender. One of the best fougeres ever created, um, and that is Jacques Guerlain. Now, or, now, Jacques Guerlain went on to do a lot of hits. Some of the greatest perfumes of all time, in my opinion. There is Le Bleu, which this is the Eau de Parfum. I need to get a version of the Eau de Toilette one day. It's on my list. The Eau de Parfum is real heavy. It's a flowery, powdery, just bomb. Uh, lots of heliotrope, lots of violet, lots of iris, lots of carnation, tons of vanilla, tons of benzoin and tonka. It's just like this, if you imagine this just as like this thick, syrupy, powdery, you know, um, fragrance that uh, it... I still wear it, believe it or not. This is one of uh, Eugene's favorite perfumes. And if you're a guy, I still say get a bottle of Lair Blue, try it, you know, wear it to bed, even if you're not going to make it your scent of the day. Understand it because it is such a beautiful fragrance, but it does have an effect on, you know, my mental aspect when I wear it. It does feel a little bit gloomy. It feels a little bit blue, like you know, an era is setting kind of thing. 
and then he went on to, of course, create Mitsuko. And Mitsuko is created, uh, is thought of by many, um, even perfumers themselves. A lot of perfumers, if you say, hey, if you could create one perfume, what would it be? They either say Mitsuko or Eau Sauvage. Uh, or maybe Eau de Hermes or something like that. But Mitsuko is um, one of the best Shifras of all time. Legendary Shifra, reference Shifra. It has that peach note with bergamot, jasmine, rose, citrus, lilac, ylang ylang, and then ambergris, oak moss, vetiver, cinnamon, spices. It's a Shifra, so it has labdanum in the base, of course. Uh, the Shifra structure is that... Um, is that um, bergamot, oak moss, labdanum thing. And it's done to perfection here. Fruity chifra. Um, this is also the eau de parfum. It's a little bit heavier than the eau de toilette. I need to track down an eau de toilette of Mitsuko as well, along with uh, Le Bleu. And then the big one for me, the one that really changed my entire perception on fragrance. When I smelled this for the first time, it uh, must have been three or four years ago now, when I smelled this for the first time, I just went, I mean, it just completely blew my mind. Um, and mostly because it's a fragrance that came out in 1925. Um, and it uh, created an oriental genre, if you will. And the Oriental genre was created by Shalimar. And so Shalimar is probably, not probably, it is my favorite vanilla fragrance of all time. And Jacques Guerlain um, basically uses bergamot in the top with vanilla in the base, and then some dirty castorium, um, maybe a touch of civet, maybe both castorium and civet. I don't know. I thought it was castorium for the longest time, but maybe there's a bit of civet in here as well. Irish, jasmine, and rose, and the Eau de Parfum came out in 1986. I also have the vintage Parfum de Toilette, which this is my favorite version of Shalimar, this one right here. You can see the dent I made in this bottle. Um, this comes out, this is like a little case that, that it sits in. And um, they used the term parfum de toilette in the 19, late 80s, early 90s, before the industry really settled on eau de parfum as, you know, what they would say for that percentage of oils before they settled on eau de toilette. Eau de Parfum, X-Tray, all that good stuff. They used to use the term Parfum de Toilette sometimes. Guerlain did. Uh, other companies used Esprit de Parfum for X-Tray. You know, all kind of different stuff like that was going on before they kind of agreed on, on these sets of names. And there's just something about this. Vanilla is not one of my favorite notes, but the way it's used here, that dirtiness, that sensualness, that, you know, almost like two bodies that are sweaty from being outside hugging each other that you know that kind of feel it's balsamic it's it's lovely um i even have the x-ray which uh this is maybe a 20 22 year old bottle and if you really want to you know lay it on heavy you could wear the x-ray it's absolutely gorgeous um it, it, it amps up the iris, rose, uh, jasmine notes. It's much more floral, but it's absolutely stunning. Uh, so, Shalimar, 1925. And then, of course, the final creation uh, in my, in my um, catalog here is the Jacques Guerlain creation Val de Nuit. This is the Eau de Toilette. And Valdenouille is this beautiful, spicy, woody aldehydes with green galbanum, citruses, orange blossom, narcissus. There is that garlinade. There is a little bit of that vanilla, that sandalwood in the base. 
with orris root, musk, oak moss, just a beautiful creation. And the Eau de Toilette I prefer because it's a little easier to wear in places like where I'm at in Texas. The Eau de Parfum is a little thicker. Um, but it, Val de Nuit is another all-time great. So Jacques Guerlain. So now we get to Jean-Paul Guerlain. Jean-Paul Guerlain, of course, had to grow up in that extraordinary, um, you know, world of being a Guerlain. And uh, what ended up happening is the Guerlain from father to son thing skipped a generation. And it went to Jean-Paul Guerlain, which was actually the grandson uh, of, um, of Jacques Guerlain. And so he had been kind of somewhat working alongside, um, he had somewhat been working alongside Jacques Guerlain, and I think they created a final perfume called Ode Together. Uh, but one thing that I did read that I found interesting, let's see if I can find it here. There was a quote that I saw that said that, or it's a little blurb. So what's crazy is Parfumo has these write-ups on these perfumers, right? And you go and you look at Jean-Claude Elena, Bertrand Duchefort, and the big names have the write-up. Jean-Paul Guerlain does not have a write-up on him, which is mind-boggling to me. Uh, but he, basically it says at 16, Jean-Paul Guerlain lost his sight. He dropped out of school, and he basically sat around the house with nothing to do. An angry 16-year-old who lost his sight. And his grandfather said, you have to get out there and you have to do something. So he brought Jean-Paul Guerlain to the factory and began teaching him to smell. So the boy grew up to become, obviously, one of the world's greatest noses. His vision was ultimately restored after several operations, but his nose remained supreme. That's the story. Now, whether that is Guerlain myth, whether there's some truth to that, whether there's some myth, some truth, and it's kind of mixed together, I don't know. Um, but amazing beginning, right? For, for, for a 16 year old who was struggling, obviously, to become the man he ultimately ended up being. Um, and I just found that really fascinating because it shows that it's not like he was, um, tapped air. He wasn't knighted to be the next in-house perfumer. It just kind of, it just kind of worked out that way. In fact, Jean-Paul Guerlain admits that he never wanted to be a perfumer, even up until age 15. Until that 16-year-old boy went to the, lost his sight and went to the facility, he did not want to be a perfumer. And he kind of took inner sanctum from his grandfather's taking him under his wing. And it began this 60 year journey through fragrance that he had. And he went through and he memorized 3000 or so natural ingredients housed in the perfumery and the Jean and the Guerlain perfumery. And they sent this young kid, this young boy now, this young man to create his, fir his first perfume. And his first perfume was created in the year 1959. And basically what happened was they um, sent him to create a scent for South America. The South American market at the time was very small. And so they said, send Jean-Paul Guerlain, you know, it's a, it's a project no one cares about. Send him off to create this scent for the South American market. So Jean-Paul Guerlain took it very seriously. He didn't just approach this as, oh, it's a summer project. He approached it like it was life or death. And he studied hard. He determined what the people in South America liked and didn't like. And he created this, which is Guerlain's Vetiver. Now, this barely made my top 100 perfumes. Um, but... It did make the top 100, but just barely. And the reason is that this is not my favorite Guerlain perfume, but from a technical aspect, from a aspect of influencing the rest of the world uh, that looked at this and took notice in, 19, in 1959, you know, from the technical aspect of creating the perfume, let's say. This is a gem.
this is a top 10 fragrance if you looked at it from, you know, the creative, technical side of things and also how it influenced um, future fragrances. And so while it's not my favorite to wear personally, there are other Guerlain's I, I enjoy wearing more. I very much respect this perfume. And like I said earlier when I was talking about Ancre Noir, I catch a lot of flack because I'm big into I'm big into certain vintage bottles. I'm big into certain distributors, certain time frames, this, that, or whatever. Guerlain's a house that you don't have to worry about that with. Do not go spend big money on a vintage Guerlain because you're not going to get the value for that money. It's not like the formulas change very much. Guerlain has an in-house perfumer. They keep things up. The, the, the houses that have the in-house perfumers suffer much less from reformulation. Guerlain does very good reformulations. I bought this bottle because I wanted the bottle. This bottle is supposed to represent the different phases of a man's life. And you can see some are frosted. And some are not and some are not frosted. This is one of the most beautiful bottles of all time, in my opinion. So it says Vetiver on one side, it says Guerlain on the other, and you can see it's an older bottle because of the five-digit batch code right there. Um, but if you just go by the modern Vetiver one that's in the Listerine bottle, or now that's in the um what do they call it? That's in the Lome Ideal bottles that look like this. Now this is what Vetiver comes in. It has a sticker like this. It says Vetiver. I'm sure you'll be just as fine. Um, I've never smelled them though. I have smelled the Listerine bottles. You're perfectly fine with that. So that, that would be my cautionary tale before people do entire videos bashing me for showing an older bottle of Vetiver. I love this bottle, but I'm all about the juice. I care about the fragrance. I care about the juice itself. The fragrance in the new Vetiver is, is beautiful. In fact, my buddy Rich Mitch did a, a four or five uh, part breakdown on Guerlain Vetiver throughout the years. Go watch that video. Uh, and he pretty much says the same thing. I think this one's a little bit more bright. It's a little bit lighter. Uh, in the sense that it's grassier, the, vetiver, the vetiver in here is cleaner than I think maybe some of the newer bottles. And so for me, since this has this cut grass feel, even though it has citruses uh, and it has some spices, basically the note breakdown is orange, bergamot, and lemon with nutmeg and pepper in the heart. Vetiver, tobacco, and tonka. And it's that tobacco in the base that really gets you. Um, people don't talk about this as a tobacco perfume, but there is a beautiful note of tobacco that comes out in the base. And even with that tobacco, I still wear this in the summer. I wear this in the spring and summer, the warmer weathers. That's when I reach for this. I never wear this in the winter. I'd rather wear Ancre Noir if I need a bed. Ancre Noir à l'extreme, the one with amber in the winter. But, um, it's a stunning perfume. Um... And the bottle is stunning. The flacon is stunning. What it did for the fragrance world was a revelation. And that basically set Jean-Paul Guerlain's career on that upward trajectory I was talking about earlier. He then followed that up with my second favorite masculine Guerlain release of all time. And he followed that up with a perfume called Abbey Rouge. Now... As you can see again, this is not necessarily a vintage bottle. I do have a vintage bottle. And in the vintage bottle, what ends up happening is the leather comes out a little bit more. They've brightened this up. They've, you know, for modern tastes, let's say. I, I've got an older bottle, I think from the 80s. And I think this is from the 2000s, you know, like between 2000 and 2012 or something, I think this bottle's from. I'm not 100% sure, 9T02. Um, but this came out in 1965, and it is supposedly a 
masculine version of Shalimar. So Jean-Paul Guerlain said, let's create a masculine version uh, of Shalimar, and it's supposed to represent the red hunting jackets. That's where the, the name Abbey Rouge comes from. You know, you um, if, if you're like a master hunter, you get given that jacket or you get given a specific pin or there's a story behind it I can't exactly remember. But it has to do with his love of hunting uh, and horses and, and all that is kind of combined into this fragrance. So there's patchouli in the heart, there's leather and benzoin and vanilla in the base, and there's a beautiful note of Brazilian rosewood. And there's a beautiful note, stunning note of carnation. I love the carnation in Abbey Rouge. It's so multifaceted. The vanilla is so sensual. The leather, you'll have to look for it. This is not a leather perfume like the leathers I talk about I love. This is not Bellamy. This is not Leonard Porom. Uh, none of that. This is, this is, this is class. You know, this is somebody who um, doesn't have to shout doesn't have to show off their their knowledge or their wealth or their you know um, IQ or prove they're the smartest or prove they're the the fastest or whatever it is this is for somebody who is completely comfortable in their skin and knows who they are they don't care what people say about them and they know what class is you know real class and real, Old money doesn't have to shout kind of thing, right? It's the new money that wants to go get the Koenigseggs and, and all that stuff and the Lamborghinis. Old money doesn't have to shout. This is old money to me. Um, and I absolutely love it. When I want to wear something that makes you feel like you're just a class above, you're a step ahead, you know, you, you are, you're in the know. You know something that everyone else doesn't know. doesn't make you better than them. But you know about a long-lost treasure, a long-lost artifact that modern men in America are not wearing Abbey Rouge from 1965. That's grandpa perfume, right? But you know better because you, you've smelled hundreds, thousands of perfumes and you know what a gem this is. That, that's Abbey Rouge to me. It's... I made this my Christmas Day scent this year because it was like 80 degrees in Texas on Christmas. It was stunning. So the scent memory... That's the kind of fragrance that this is. It's a special fragrance. You don't just wear this one lying around the house. For me, you can. And you'll notice I have the Eau de Toilette. Even my backup bottle is the Eau de Toilette. I do not like the Eau de Parfum. It's, it's too... They supposedly put an Oud note in there. It, it loses the... What makes this fragrance so special for me is there's this unbelievable balance between citruses, lemons, oranges, bergamot, lime, tangerine. There's this citrusy, like, like oil floating on the top of water feel. Citruses are, are there, and, and the citruses are very important in this fragrance. And then there's that heavier resinous, you know, labdanum and leather and uh, ambery, all that stuff underneath, vanilla. Of course, vanilla is very important in Shalimar. It's very important here, that Guerlainade that's heavier, but they never cross into each other's realm. They they never overwhelm each other. It's never too citrusy. It's never too heavy with the vanilla. It's just right. The EDT for me is just right. Uh, and there's some flankers of this. I do like the dress code flanker. You know, that's not Jean-Paul Guerlain. But they've done a million flankers of Abbey Rouge. There's even a new one called La Instinct, which I've never smelled, but I don't hear very good things about it. Um, so that's Abbey Rouge. Then there's a new addition to my collection. I have not given this a full wear yet, although I will one day soon. And this is called Shamad. Now this is the Eau de Toilette. You can't tell because the... Writing was, um, it was stripped off in transit because it, it leaked basically is what ended up happening. So it, it leaked and stripped this off. Um, this little thing didn't stop it from leaking in transit, but I got a great deal on this. 
and this is a vintage bottle from whatever, 80s, 90s, whatever it was. Um, it's this green floral, it's this aldehydic green floral with spices, the guerlinades underneath again. There's a lot going on here. It's going to take a long time for me to break this down. This is not something you smell and go, oh, I understand it. No, this is complex. One of the most beautiful bottles you'll ever see as well. If you look at one of those older bottles with the upside down hearts, there's a story to that as well. Um, and this is aldehydes, bergamot, hyacinth, jasmine, rose, lilac, galbanum, clove, lily of the valley, amber, benzoin, peru balsam, sandalwood, tolu balsam, vanilla, and vetiver. Extraordinarily classy creation. Um, Got to get to know this more. I'll do a review on it one day once I wear it more and understand it, that kind of thing. Um, so we go to my third favorite, masculine. This is kind of a toss-up between this and Abbey Rouge. Um, this and Abbey Rouge would fight for second favorite masculine for me. It would depend on the situation. If I was going to a board meeting, you know, where I wanted to wear something special, I would maybe wear this. If I was just going for everyday work, I would maybe wear Abbey Rouge. Uh, this is Darby. And Guerlain's Darby originally came in a bottle that looked like, um, it looked like this, like a plate, like a Centurion's breast armor. It was actually called Centurion. That was the code name for the fragrance originally. And it's this woody, spicy fragrance that almost feels like it's a Spanish leather fragrance. Um, the leather is more prominent here than in uh, Abbey Rouge, but you still have to look for it sometimes. It's not in your face. It's not, it's, you know, Guerlain doesn't do leather like Hermes does leather, like, let's say. And what happens is you get this green mugwort artemisia with citruses opening. There's pimento, pepper, nutmeg, rose, and jasmine in the heart. Leather, vetiver, sandalwood, patchouli, and moss in the base. And it just leaves this, you know, boss-like impression, this C-suite-like impression. Like you're in the presence of somebody with serious amounts of authority on a topic, you know. If you were one of the leading doctors who's pub been published in um, peer-reviewed journals thousands of times, that kind of thing, and, and you were going to a conference, I would tell you to wear Abby, um, I would tell you to wear Darby. If you are the CEO and you're going to an important board meeting, I would tell you to wear Darby. Uh, but I really feel like this is a boss scent. People say that all the time. This is a this is a boss scent. This is the serious boss scent to me, though. This and Patu Porom to me are the two boss scents that I would that I would wear. They 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 could both slot right into that category for me. It's so good. It I mean it it really has to be worn to appreciate the nuances that this fragrance has. It's absolutely beautiful. It's gorgeous. It's out and out masculine. Um, and it's from, it's from 1985, my favorite decade. So Darby is, I mean, it's, it's a unicorn right now. And I would tell you the same thing I told you about Vetiver, the same thing I told you about Abbey Rouge. Just if you want to find this fragrance, just find a bottle. Even if it's the new reformulated version that they did in 2005 or whatever it is in that square bottle. Um, even if it's the Thierry Vasa reform that has more carnation in it or whatever they did to try to mask the fact that uh, they couldn't use the oak moss or, you know, that kind of thing. Even if it has to be that one, that is a great reformulation. I would say just find a bottle. If you're in the if you're in the market for Darby, don't worry about versions. Uh, this is actually not the original version. Uh, the original version came in that Centurion looking bottle, that Eagle bottle as they call it. But any bottle you can find, any bottle you can find, I would say get.
It's it's absolutely worth it. Even the new stuff. The the new stuff. If you if you're a fan of Darby and and you have a collection like mine, and someone told you to keep one fragrance, and you chose to keep that new bottle of Darby, I wouldn't be mad at you at all. It's fantastic. It's a fantastic perfume. Uh, I have a decant of it. Actually, I should have brought it. Um, I'll do a comparison video one day for you guys, but I think they're close enough that it it doesn't matter. I wouldn't pay big money for a vintage. But even the now that the fragrance is completely discontinued, even that reformulated bottle is going for bigger money, unfortunately. Okay, next, we're going to go to Samsara, which came out in 1989. And there's an interesting story on Samsara that I was reading about. Let's see if I can find it again. So Samsara... Um, so it says that um, with Samsara, there's a romantic story behind Samsara. So for once, Guerlain decided to offer external perfumers the opportunity to, to create their next perfume. And so they took all of these, you know, indications of interest or whatever you want to call it from other perfumers, not a Guerlain, which has never happened before. Jean-Paul Guerlain submitted his creation anonymously. So a modern ombre made for a woman he was in love with. Out of all of the submissions, his was chosen. So they didn't know it was his, it was anonymous, and Samsara was born, and he won her heart too. That's the story. Now again, whether that is truth, Guerlain myth, or some mixture of the truth, I don't know if we'll ever know. I do know that Parfumo now lists Jean-Paul Guerlain and Gerard Anthony as the perfumers. Gerard Anthony is a beast. He is, he is one of my favorites. He's created some stuff that has completely blown me away. Uh, if you love fragrances like Akitos, if you love Balenciaga Por Homme, if you love Cristobal Por Homme, if you love Azaro Por Homme, if you love Homme de Grey, if you love XS, if you love Salvador by Salvador Dali, that's all... Gerard Anthony, right? And so Parfumo lists him as working with Jean-Paul Guerlain on Samsara, but the claim to fame for Samsara is it was supposed to dose real Mysore sandalwood at 30%, which is insane. Um, now, around 2002, they stopped using real Mysore sandalwood in, in fragrances. My bottle is literally from 2002. So I don't know whether I... Got the good luck and caught the, it's UK031. I don't know if I caught the good luck and just caught the right side of it, or if I caught the bad luck and just caught the bad side of it. Either way, this is the Eau de Parfum from about 20 years ago. I love the fragrance. Sometimes it gives me a little bit of a headache. Um, this is one of those fragrances that just gets me right here sometimes, and it's that oriental floral thing it's i think it's the i think it's the uh yellow ylang ylang flowers that really get me in this one there is this peachiness a bit like mitsuko there is this vanilla in the base with the guerlainade and stuff but the sandalwood is absolutely beautiful that floral sandalwood amazing perfume um then we jump to my favorite masculine guerlain of all time and if you watched my top 100 countdown, this made top 10. And it came out in 1992. And it's called Heritage. Now again, just like Abbey Rouge, you'll notice that I have the Eau de Toilette. I prefer the Eau de Toilette. I like the Eau de Parfum of Heritage more than I like the Eau de Parfum of Abbey Rouge. But I prefer the Eau de Toilette. That's my choice. Um, the Eau de Toilette is a little bit more versatile. I wear this all year round, any any place, any time. Um, this is signature scent for me. This could be a signature scent for me, easy. Um, and it's it's such a 
Uh, it's such a complex fragrance. Fragrantica lists something like 26 notes. Insane. Um, if you want complexity, if you want your fragrances to change, um, you know, it does start out smelling a little bit like the forest floor, but then it just takes off like a rocket. Rockstar patchouli comes in, beautiful orris root, oak moss, cedar, coriander, geranium, balsam fir, pepper and pink pepper, rose. I mean, there's a violet note in here that maybe if if I had to pick a fragrance that had a violet like note that inspired maybe Roja's love of the violet note, this would be the masculine version of that. Maybe there's a feminine version of it. But the violet note in here is absolutely stunning. Everything about this fragrance is, you know, the name Heritage goes back to the Heritage of Guerlain and how you should be able to smell different Guerlain fragrances inside of this perfume. So when you first spray, if you know what Jiki smells like, you'll get a little bit of Jiki. Um, there is that vanilla feel from Shalimar a bit. Not much. I don't know. Maybe there's just a hair. Maybe it's just in the Guerlainade. You get a bit of that vanilla-like vibe. Maybe it's more the bergamot from, from Shalimar, not the vanilla. But um, it's amazing. I absolutely love this perfume. Uh, and it not only goes to the past, you know, you'll get the sandalwood from Samsara. You'll get the vetiver from vet. You know, it does all that. Not only it does it do that, but it also leans to the future. It gives this foreshadowing of the patchouli used in L'Instant de Guerlain, which is not a Jean-Paul Guerlain creation, so I didn't have it out for this video, but the patchouli in L'Instant de Guerlain, which was a huge hit, it was, oh God, it was competing with Dior Homme at the time, was a direct descendant of Heritage. Amazing. Amazing fragrance. And then the Guerlain that uh, Jean-Paul Guerlain created that was the biggest flop of all time, but I personally love it. I think it's a steal. I think it's highly underrated. Uh, and I think it's one of the coolest bottles of all time is Coriolan. Now Coriolan was reformulated and it was put into that same square bottle I was telling you about Darby was put into. And it was called Lame Dune Eros. Lame Dune Eros. And I'll do a side by side comparison before this is all gone. As you can see, I've given it a, a good amount of wares. And I think they're the same fragrance. I think Thierry Vasser did the same thing he did with Darby. They just reformulated it, they changed the name. I think it's the same fragrance as Coriolan. Uh, and since, for all you gatekeeper, gate people who are offended at gatekeepers, this, that, or whatever, um, either version. You can get either version, but since this was such a flop, there's so many bottles of this floating around out there for cheap. If you can find one unsprayed, don't buy partials of Cor Coriolan because the citruses tend to go fast. So I would say if you can find one that's unsprayed where the where the clock hasn't started yet and you can find one from somebody that you know and trust, just go for Coriolan because it'll be cheaper. I got two of these for $100 a couple years back. $100 unsprayed, two of them. So I have a backup. And um, this was selling for $300 or something. So now I don't know what it's for. I haven't, I haven't priced Lame Dune Eros in a long time, but this is one of those situations where I would say either one, you know, no one's gonna look down on you if you're wearing Lame Dune Eros. We're not gonna say, uh, you've got the wrong version there, bud. But I will tell you that uh, if you can get Coriolan cheaper, 
they're basically the same. You know, Thierry Vasso just had to probably do some reformulations, but to your to your nose, unless you're a perfumer, you probably won't detect any differences. And then we're going to get to the final Jean-Paul Guerlain in my collection. And this one I only have a decant of because it's a very rare fragrance and bottles of this stuff are going for thousands on the internet. Don't pay thousands for this, even though I love it and I would love to have a bottle. I'm happy with my decant. This is called Metallica. Well, they renamed it to Metallis, but it was originally called Metallica. The band Metallica actually sued Guerlain or threatened to if they didn't change it or something. I can't remember. This was during the Napster days, if you remember. Right? This was during the Napster days. There you go. Uh, look at the color of that juice. My God. Uh, so, to me, okay, this is Jean-Paul Guerlain's final salute to something like Shalimar because it takes that bergamot and vanilla top and bottom and it just kind of replaces all of the innards. It, it takes carnation, orange blossom, rose, and ylang ylang in the heart and then amber, iris, tonka, and vanilla in the base with just bergamot in the top and... No, I mean, nobody does vanilla like Guerlain. Nobody. And this is a perfect example of Jean-Paul Guerlain, even late in his career, creating something true to the Guerlain heritage. No offense, no pun intended for heritage, but true to the Guerlain heritage, Shalimar. And the florals in here are just... Stunning. They are absolutely stunning. Um, definitely full bottle worthy. Not worth thousands though, unless you're just made of money and money doesn't matter. But on a value proposition, I would say just get a decant. Just try to smell it. So you can say you smelled Metallica or Metalis, whatever you want to call it. The spicy vanilla floral thing. Spicy carnation. Um, it's gorgeous. It's just gorgeous. Um, it's it's not masculine though. So if you're somebody who has to have, if you have to wear things like Darby, Metallica is not for you. But if you're somebody like me who has started, you know, wearing any fragrance anytime, anywhere, that kind of thing, and and you love fragrances like Shalimar, Mitsuko, Lair Bleu, Val de Nuit, this is another one to put on the list. No one talks about this. Very few people talk about it. Not no one, because I heard uh, Galen and Thomas from early Greek talk about Metallica in the past. Uh, and it's beautiful. I mean, just it just is. It just it just wipes the floor with most niche fragrances you'll you'll smell nowadays. So that's the thing about Guerlain. The beauty of Guerlain, the past, the history, the stories. Um, the heritage, um, there's really no other way to say it, you know, the pedigree of, of the Guerlain house is bar none unmatched. But then, unfortunately, Jean-Paul Guerlain had a terrible exit. He was fired from in, being a house perfumer. He was even fined in public. Uh, some court fined him for his racial slur that he said on national TV. So... What a terrible way to end one of the most illustrious careers of all time, but that doesn't change the fact from a perfume lover for me. He's one of the greatest noses ever and one of my favorite perfumers of all time. Uh, and so that's my collection of uh, not all Guerlains. Obviously, there's more Guerlains back there, but just from some of the older perfumers, uh, I just wanted to set kind of the foundation before we started talking about Jean-Paul Guerlain. If there's other Jean-Paul Guerlains you want to talk about, put them in the comments. Let me know what your favorites are from Jean-Paul Guerlain. Um, I've been kind of holding off on doing this video for a long time. I probably did not do it justice because, I mean, how can you, you know, how can you talk about 
one of the masters, one of the greatest to have ever done it. Um, Hall of Fame level perfumer to me. And um, so I hope you've enjoyed this perfumer's portfolio video. It was a special one. Um, let me know what you think. Love seeing your faces in the comments. A like and a subscription always helps the channel, but obviously it's not, um, it's, it's not something that I'm going to hold your feet to the fire to. If you don't want to, then it's no big deal. I'm not going to sit there and ask for it a million times, but it is very much appreciated, uh, because it helps with my exposure. And so I appreciate everybody who watches and comments and likes and all that stuff very much. Uh, love reading your comments throughout the day. Really brightens my day up. And uh, see you again tomorrow with another video. Hope you guys enjoyed this one. Bye now.